So today we're going to uh, do Friday's lesson. A uh, few things you need to do before we begin. Um, if you look at the tasks, it says we need to download and print two things. The first one is the note packet. Um, some of you might have gone by your teacher's room um, and you would have received this note packet. Um, if not, you need to download uh, the note packet pertaining to today, as well as uh, the Lewis dot diagrams and ionic bonding worksheet. Uh, this worksheet, if you look down here, will be due next Thursday, January 28th. You will still be having your test next Tuesday, so that this worksheet will be due the next um, day of class. So again, your test will still be this coming Tuesday. Uh, since we don't have school today, we expect you guys to come see us on Monday, um, on that blue day, if you have any questions uh, pertaining to the test or the review. Um, you can also email either me or Miss Ward today. So here's a look at what we're going to be doing today. It's going to be a little bit longer than what we did yesterday um, or the other day. The other day was pretty short. So we are going to look at the properties of metals. We talked about how they're formed. We're going to look at their properties. We're going to look at um, introduce ionic and covalent bonding and look at how we can relate electronegativity differences to those bonds. And then we are going to talk about the octet rule, Lewis dot diagrams, and then we're going to go into ionic bonding. So let's get started. All right, the first uh, property, if you look at the table in your notes, we're going to talk about is uh, metallic bonds conduct heat. Um, the first thing you need to do is be able to understand what it means for heat to be conducted. Um, and heat is energy associated with the movement of particles in any material. And as we learned the other day, we have these electrons that are freely moving about. They're constantly moving in and between these cations that were formed. So because these electrons are free to move, um, that heat is easily passed through the movement of those particles. Okay, As the particles move and the faster they move, the um, more heat we have and that heat is easily transferred from one space to another as they can travel with those electrons. Okay, It also conducts electricity um, and you can see we're going to use this GIF right here to explain that. So electricity is the flow of moving electrons and again that's if we know this definition that electricity is the flow of moving electrons, we understand that metallic bonds have freely flowing electrons. So if we want to conduct electricity, we can conduct it through those freely moving electrons. So because of the sea of electrons, it is very easy um, for electricity to flow. Therefore, they are good conductors of electricity. So I've kind of written out uh, an answer for you guys. It says the delocalized electrons are free to move in between the cations. These mobile electrons can act as charge carriers, carriers in the conduction of electricity or as energy conductors in the conduction of heat. Okay? So you can pause the video if you'd like to copy that down. Otherwise, we are going to move on. All right. Metallic bonds or metals are also malleable. You need to know what malleable means. Malleable means that they can be flattened into sheets. Um, so if we have like a mallet like this, like you can pound metal and flatten it out. Um, yes, some metals are stiffer than others and they're harder to flatten out, but they can be flattened. Okay, and this again is because of these freely moving electrons. If you haven't realized, the sea of electrons is what makes uh, metallic pro is is the uniqueness of metallic bonds. It's the key to why they have the properties they do. So because these electrons are free to move around, if we shift, if we hammer down and shift these cations, these electrons are going to con continue to shift with them because they can easily move around. So if this cation shifts and it would get closer to this cation, which we would think would make it want to repel and break, but it doesn't because these electrons flow in between so that it doesn't break when we pound on it. Okay, so because those electrons can freely get in between as the, we shift the cations with our pounding, the electrons shift as well to counteract any repulsion that might um, occur. Okay, metallic bonds are also ductile, and ductile means they can be pulled into wires. So this is um, the best picture we could come up with, and if you took like a, a thicker thing and you stretched it out, and let's say we took these 
this two level layer and we stretched it out to make this one long two level layer instead of a shorter four level layer, okay? Um, again, these cations are able to shift past one another and stretch out, meaning they pass by until they come down here, just as they were for the same reason they were malleable. As the, these, these light gray things are the cations and the dark gray area represents the sea of electrons. But as these cations are shifting past one, one another, they aren't repelled because the sea of electrons continue to go in between them, counteracting any repulsion that might exist. Okay. Again, I've written you out um, a definition. I've also included this GIF. If you look um, at this GIF, you can see this in action. As we um, pound it out, malleable, and you can see it's also kind of stretching itself out. You can see as these cations shift, the electrons shift as well in order for these cations not to repel and break off of each other. So the delocalized electrons in the sea of electrons in a metallic bond enable the metal atoms to roll over each other when a stress is applied. Stress being any form of pulling or pounding. Okay. Um, if any of the cations are shifted, the electrons can freely shift as well, always holding together the shifting cations. Again, if you'd like to write this um, explanation down, please pause the video, but I'm going to move on. Okay, so that was all we had for metallic properties. There's four properties that you're responsible for and their reasonings, but now we're going to introduce ionic and covalent bonds. Most of you are probably familiar with these from some of your middle school science classes, but first we're going to look at how electronegativity can relate to these two bonds. So the type of bonding that occurs depends on the difference in electronegativity of the atoms in the bond. We already looked at what electronegativity was, um, the difference was in metallic bonds, it was always going to be zero because we had the exact same element. Okay, If you remember, it's important to remember the definition of electronegativity. It is the tendency for an element to attract electrons when it bonds with another element. So the higher the electronegativity, the more it will attract, or the higher probability it has, or the stronger it wants to attract the electrons. Okay. So how electronegativity differences determine the bond type? If the difference in electronegativity is very large, meaning one of the atoms we're dealing with has a very high electronegativity and wants the elements a lot, and the other one has a very low electronegativity and doesn't want them as much, that means that one atom has a strong attraction to the electron while the other atom wants to lose electrons. So what's going to happen when you have one that really, really wants electrons and one that wants to lose them? Well, they both get their way. Electrons from one atom are removed and attached to another. So the guy that wanted them takes them from the guy who wants to give them up anyway. If you, does anybody know what type of bond this is? You probably learned this in middle school. Okay, what is going to happen to those atoms? They will become cations and anions because one atom that took on electrons is now more negative, so it's an anion, and the one that lost electrons is now a cation. Okay, they um, will produce a noble gas electron configuration. This is what we like to refer to in classes. They now have a full outer shell. Okay, and what kind of bond will this form? An ionic bond. So ionic bonds form when you have a very high difference in electronegativity. One, I like to think of it as a tug of war. So you have a tug of war and you have a really strong person on one side and a really weak person on one side. Okay, so the strong person is going to win, they are going to take the electrons, forming an anion, the other guy will lose, he will be a cation, and they will now be opposite charges, so they will attract to one another, an ionic bond. Okay, based on our trends for electronegativity, what combination of elements would lead to large differences in electronegativities? Well, elements on opposite sides of the periodic table. Cations are on the left side, okay, anions are on the right side. We know electronegativity increases from left to right, okay? So the ones on the right side of the periodic table, the anions, they form anions because they want electrons. They're going to get more and become anions. The ones on the left, they are cations, okay? They are going to lose. So the farther apart they are, okay, the ones on the left will bond with ones on the right to form ionic bonds because they have very big differences. One's all the way on the left, one's all the way on the right. Okay. If the difference in electronegativity 
reactivity is small, so the opposite. That means that both atoms pull on the electrons with almost the same amount of pull force. Okay, not exactly necessarily, but very, very close. So you've got a tug of war, and it might tug a little to the right and a little to the left, but no one ever can pull hard enough to win the tug of war. So what's going to happen to the electrons in this situation? Well, in the tug of war analogy, I just like to say that there's a stalemate. But in bonding, the electrons are going to be shared. So a stalemate in a tug of war, they're going to share the victory. What happens with the bonding? They're going to share the electrons. So what's going to happen to the atoms? They share electrons in such a way as to create a noble gas configuration for each atom. So they share so that both of them can get to a, and I like to think of this as a semi-noble gas state because if they're sharing, they don't have full custody, if you will, of the electrons, but they're jointly, they have. If, if they both include the amount that they're sharing, they both can create a noble gas configuration. So what kind of bond will form here? This is a covalent bond, okay? So, based on our trends for electronegativity, what combination of elements would lead to a small difference in electronegativities? Elements that are close together on the right side of the periodic table. The reason we don't say the left side is because when they're on the left side, they're gonna be metallic bonds. Uh, um, if they're a metal and a metal, that are different at, uh, elements, they won't bond. We said metals are only going to bond with metals if they are the exact same element. So we can look at the right side of the periodic table at our non-metals and our metalloids, they will bond with each other. So elements that are close together, we can have a non-metal that will bond with a non-metal or a metalloid will bond with a non-metal. A metalloid will not bond with a metalloid. We'll either have a non-metal and a non-metal or a metalloid and a non-metal. 